If you're a mom, won't you stand, please? If you're a mother, please stand. I tell you, if we had a million lives, we could never express to you how much we love and appreciate you. In fact, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be here. And uh, we love you very much, and I want us to tell our moms how much we love them. Can we do that? God bless you guys. Amen. Just remain standing. Everybody else stand with me. Uh, I've, I've taken the title this morning, kind of stole it from an old hymn, When We All Get Together. And I want us to be thinking about that, when we all get together. In Luke chapter 15, if you open your Bibles there, the Bible says, Oh, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's pray together. Father, bless us now as we study your word. I pray that we will take your word and apply it to our lives. And Father, we do pray for our mothers today that they will feel loved, respected, honored, and appreciated. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. There was a group of second graders that um, got to answer some questions about mothers. And these are absolutely hilarious. I want you to listen to this. Why did God make mothers? Response was, mostly to clean the house and to help us get out of there when we were getting born. <laughs> Here's another. Why did your mom marry your dad? Kid responded, she got too old to do anything else with him. <laughs> My grandma says that mom didn't have her thinking cap on. <laughs> Another. Why did God give you your mother and not some other mom? The response was, because he knew we were already related and my mom liked me better than the other moms did. <laughs> Who is boss at your house? Response. I guess my mom is, but only because she has a lot more to do than dad. <laughs> and one last one. What would it take to make your mom perfect? Response. On the inside, she is already perfect. On the outside, maybe some plastic surgery. <laughs> Don't say that to your mama. Amen. <laughs> On May the 9th in 1914, Woodrow Wilson proclaimed that the second Sunday of every May would be celebrated as Mother's Day each year. I love Mother's Day. My mom's been up in heaven for a long, long time. But my mom was such a blessing to all of us kids and her family and her friends. Mother's Day is important. Do you believe that? You know, the latest... Uh, craziness that I've been seeing on television is, you know what, well, for years they've tried to do away with the term Mother's Day, and they don't like the term Father's Day, and so now they want to call it Birthing Persons Day. I mean, that kind of delegates you down to the role of a puppy mill, doesn't it? That your only purpose is to give birth. No, there's a difference between someone who just gives birth and someone who mothers those that they give birth to, or any other child. Amen. So we thank God for our mothers. Um, we've been uh, celebrating Mother's Day now for, get, get this, 107 years. 107 years. Uh, there have been churches just like ours that the pastor's gotten up on this day and tried to honor the best that he could the mothers there in his congregation. But we can never say enough. We can never preach enough sermons. We can never do enough to really show our deep gratitude for our moms. Think about what all they do. They sit up with you when you're sick. When you throw up, they clean it up because dad hit the road. That's what I did. They wash your clothes. They sweep the floors, mop the floors. They cry with us when we're sad. They laugh with us, with us when we're happy. Uh, they change diapers and all kinds of stuff. Mobs do count, a countless number of things. Why do they do that? Because they love their family. That's why they do it. Someone once said that moms are chauffeurs, gardeners, counselors, bookkeepers, budget managers, interior decorators, errand runners, dietitians, secretaries, and hostesses, just to name a few things. How many of you ladies like to cook? Would you raise your hand? You like to cook? Uh, I still remember coming home on church, from church on Sunday afternoon, my mother would fry up the Baptist bird chicken. 
And I loved it. Every Sunday we had chicken, and I loved it. I miss, eat, I miss eating that chicken she made. I don't know what she did, but it was so good. And, my, and she'd always have a bowl of crumbs. You know what I'm talking about? And my sister and I would fight over who got the most crumbs, you know. <laughs> Almost count them out. Here's one for you, one for me, you know. Uh, it was great. But, you know, some, some ladies are not good cooks. They'll even tell you that they're not. But here's how you can know. You know you're a bad cook if... Your family automatically heads to the table every time they hear a fire siren. <laughs> or your son goes outside to make mud pies and the rest of your family grabs forks and follows him. That's when you know you're a bad cook. Or how about your kid's favorite drink is Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> your kids get even with a neighborhood bully by inviting them over for dinner. <laughs> And then one last one, your husband refers to the smoke detector as an oven timer. <laughs> May not be a good cook then. So someone's calculated that if we were to pay our moms for everything they do, it would be well into six figures a year. Well into six figures a year because of the way they serve us and love us. We appreciate our moms and we love our moms. I want to share with you three things this morning that I've seen in this story. Here's the first one. This is a woman who had a shattered spirit. She lost the coin and she literally was broken hearted over this lost coin. Obviously, as we read the text there, she's very sad about this. But that coin reveals something to us that we might just miss if we don't pay specific attention to it. Here's verse 8. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. Now she lost a silver coin. That word silver is not used very much in the New Testament. Used quite a bit in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament only a handful of times. Well, it wasn't commonplace among the poor for them to have silver. That was not an everyday thing for them. Now this particular piece of silver was, guess, guess how much it was worth? 18 cents in today's money. 18 Sense. That's all that it was worth. It was not of a lot of value. It's like you and I losing a nickel or a dime or a quarter or something. We might fret a little bit about it, but we're not going to spend hours and hours looking for that nickel or dime or quarter. We're not going to do that. But this particular silver coin had a very, uh, very much a sentimental value attached to it. It more than likely, because it says she had 10 coins, she lost one, it was probably a part of what's called a Semeti. Have you ever heard of a Semeti? Here's a picture of one. I know you've probably seen them and didn't know what they were called. That's called, it's a headband, has coins around it, and it's called a Semeti. And often, these Semetis were given as a wedding gift. So more than likely, she had received it as a wedding gift. It was near and dear to her heart. You have anything that it, it, it doesn't really have much value to anybody other than you, you know? I have my dad's watch, his wrist watch. Uh, he died when he was only 43. I was just six years old. And that's one of the last things I have of my dad is that wrist watch. In fact, when I got it, when I found it, I had to take it to a jeweler to get it fixed. Now, it probably cost a whole lot more to get it fixed than what the watch was worth. That watch doesn't mean anything to anybody except me. And I treasure it and I value it. And I've got it in a special place in my home in its own little box in its ho at, at home because it means something to me. It'd be kind of like if you lost your wedding ring, you'd probably fret over that and you'd probably search for that wedding ring. But the sentimental value of that wedding ring, or this, in this case, that coin from the Semeti, is worth a whole lot more than the object itself. But what does this coin represent? Notice again in, the verse, in verse 8 it says loses. What woman if she loses a coin? Now that word lose right there means to be destroyed or to be wasted. Now this coin didn't get lost all by itself. It wasn't sitting up on the shelf somewhere and thought, you know, I'm going to play hide and seek for a few days or a few hours. That's not what happened. It became lost. And the Bible said it was almost as if it had been destroyed. Because it had disappeared, it could not be found. And this woman, her heart is heavy, broken, and green. Because like I said, it was probably a wedding gift. Now figuratively speaking, guess what that coin represents? A soul. It represents a soul. And here we have the picture of a home. 
and we have a lost family member in the home. So here we have this lost soul, it represents this, a lost soul in the home that needs to be saved. Now, could you place any monetary value, whatever it might be, upon a person's soul? You cannot. A person's soul is priceless, right? And so this is demonstrating for us that, you know, we need to be concerned over someone's lost soul in our home. Or maybe you've got a loved one or a dear friend, and you know that they do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the Bible is bearing out here, you should be concerned about that, or they will meet their destruction. That's their word right there. They will meet their destruction. There was an old man that cared for his very, very sick wife, and she was getting up in her years, and her mind began to slip. And some things Sometimes she would say things that were just totally out of character or out of place. And one time in the middle of the day, she said, John, John, it's getting late. Are you coming to bed? And later on, just a few minutes later, she said, John, are all the doors and shut and locked? Are all the windows shut and locked in the middle of the day? And then later on, she said, John, have you turned out all the lights? And then this woman who was well into her years said this, John, Are all the children in? Are all the children in? When I read that story, I thought, you know, we need to ask ourselves this question. Are all of our children in the family of God? Have they all been born again? Have you witnessed to them? Have you shown them Christ? Do they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? So here's this woman who lost this coin, and now she is desperately seeking that coin. Now, she knew specifically exactly what she was looking for, and she launched a full investigation, we might call it Operation Rescue. She wanted to find that coin from that Semedi. Now, look at the desire of this desperate woman in the story. You can almost feel it, can't you? You can can see it leaping off the pages. She's desperate. She's got to find this coin, and it's consuming her heart, consuming her mind. Now, notice this. Her coin was not lost in her neighbor's house. Her coin was not lost somewhere out in the street. Her coin was not lost when she was shopping at the market. The Bible says the coin was lost where? In her own home. Now think about that coin representing a soul. There were two men that were talking at a lunch, a business lunch. One was a very wealthy businessman and and the other was an aspiring young businessman that wanted to be like that wealthy businessman. And during the conversation, that wealthy businessman told the young one, he said, you know, I've got a son who's in prison for the sale and possession of narcotics. Later on in that conversation, the young businessman said, you know, I'd give up everything. I'd I'd give up everything to have what you have. And that wealthy man said, and I'd give it all away if my son knew God. What price can you put on a soul? Especially if it's someone you love. Especially if it's someone that you gave birth to. Especially if it's someone who lives in your own home. So the Lord is saying right here, a family member who is lost ought to make us desperate. You know who L.R. Scarborough was? Great, great theologian. Great teacher of the Word of God. He was conducting one time a revival in a church in a small town, and and this well-to-do woman invited him to come to dinner after the uh, revival service was over. And when they got there, the woman looked at Dr. Scarborough, and she said, you know, I've, I've got a question, Dr. Scarborough. What would it be? He asked. And she said, my children are not saved. They're not saved. I've watched children of other families getting saved, and yet my own boys seem to have no concern. They've got no interest in giving their hearts to Jesus. And Scarborough, Dr. Scarborough looked at her and said, ma'am, let me tell you why. Your boys are dry-eyed and unconvicted because their mother is dry-eyed and unconvicted. That startled that woman. She said, you know, whatever do you mean by a statement like that? And he asked, well, I can prove it to you. He said, have you ever had a conversation with them about their salvation? And she kind of ducked her head a bit. And she said, no, no, I never have. And Dr. Scarborough then asked, he said, have you ever spent a sleepless night weeping over the lostness of your boys? And she again ducked her head down and she said, no, 
I've never, I've never done that. And he said, ma'am, your boys are unsaved because their mother has no burden for them. Do you have a burden for your children, your grandchildren, your family members, your spouse, your friends? Do you have a burden for their lostness? Now look at the determination of this particular woman in verse 8. What woman does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now that word carefully sometimes translated diligently. They're both great words. It means an earnest endeavor. So she's searching carefully, diligently, earnestly trying to find that coin. Notice how, di- how diligent she was. She lights a lamp. Back in those days, homes were dark, especially at night. They were dark. Most of the homes back then only had one window. And so she's in this dark home and she lights a lamp, which is not going to give out a great deal of light, but nonetheless, it gave out some light. And then she swept the floor. She probably had a makeshift broom made out of branches. That's the way they made their brooms back then. And she was probably under the the dimness of this light, sweeping back and forth, back and forth. And the Bible says she was searching carefully, diligently, until she tries to find it, until she finds it. Now notice that she didn't find it immediately, but the Bible bears out that she never gave up. She refused to quit looking. So she's looking for that silver coin, probably part of her Semedi, that she cannot find. And you know what Jesus is showing us right here? He's showing us how to bring a lost family member to Christ as Lord and Savior. You say, what? He is. Look at this. He says, first of all, she lit a candle. Church, tell me, who is the light of the world? Let me ask you again. Who's the light of the world? It's Jesus. He is the light of the world. She lit a candle. And then she swept the house. You know what that tells us? We need to live live a clean and a godly life. Sweep the house. If we want our family members to know Christ as Lord and Savior, light the candle, shine the light of Jesus. And secondly, make sure you're living a clean life and not a hypocritical life before your family. And then she searched diligently, which means she did not give up. She was determined she was going to find that lost coin. And guess what happened? Her persistence, it paid off, didn't it? It paid off. In Luke 15, it consists of one parable with three different pictures. You say, what do you mean? Well, you remember this, there's the parable of the lost sheep, right? And then there's the parable of the lost coin, the one we just read. And then there's the parable of the lost son, the prodigal father, right? Or the prodigal son and the loving father, right? So there's three different stories there, but they're all types. And it's really interesting the way the Bible, the Word of God weaves all this together. Because if you read the story about the lost sheep, That is a picture of the Lord Jesus as shepherd. Our Lord is our shepherd, amen? A shepherd takes care of his sheep. A shepherd loves his sheep. A shepherd is concerned with what's going on with his sheep. That's our Lord. And then we have a picture right here of this mother picturing the Holy Spirit. You notice how the Holy Spirit is constantly, continuously, if you know Jesus, speaking to your heart guiding you, instructing you, and at times convicting you. So this mother right here is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the prodigal son's father. Who does that picture? God the Father, right? It's a picture there. Now, my son Chris, uh, well, it still is a golfer, but he played golf in high school. And he's really a good golfer. Uh, and sometimes I'd go to one of his tournaments and I'd get there a little bit late And I would try to find the highest place on the golf course, which is hard to do in Houston, Texas. (laughs) But I try to get a vantage point where I could see Chris somewhere on that course, some off of the distance. And I would know Chris when I saw him. Why? Because of his gait, the way he walked. I would recognize his walk and then I could go to that hole and watch him play the golf tournament. Imagine the, the loving father in the story of the prodigal son. The son's been away for a long time. And I would imagine, I just picture him in my mind's eye sitting in a rocker out on the front porch somewhere. And every day he'd look down the road and say, is that my son? Man. No, not him. And then he looked down this way. Is that my son? Is he, is he coming home today? No, that's not him. But one day he looked down that road and he recognized his son's gait. 
And can you imagine the joy he felt when he jumped off of that porch and came running to his son, didn't lecture him, he just loved on him. Amen. Can you imagine that? That's a wonderful image that we have of God the Father. Well, our text, the mother found something that had been lost, and notice what she did. In verse 9, there's this internal rejoicing there in the home. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which was lost. She had exhausted every measure to find that coin. And every day she had been faithful to look, to search, sweep. Look, search, and sweep. Look, and search, and sweep. She was diligent. She was not going to give up. And then one day she sweeps and she looks down and lo and behold, there is that coin. Can you imagine the joy she felt when she found that coin? I'll bet she said, glory to God, I have found it. And the Bible says she invites all of her family and friends over for a big party. She was going to rejoice about that. There was a man who was, got saved as an adult. And one morning he called his mom early in the morning. He said, mom, I got some good news for you. And she said, you don't even have to tell me. I've been up all night long praying for you. At 4 a.m. this morning, God told me that he saved you, which was true. And that man said he heard his mom drop the phone and she was yelling all through the house, praise God, praise God, my son has been saved. She rejoiced because he'd been saved. And that man wound up being a preacher. Can you imagine that? He wound up being a preacher. And then there's an internal, an eternal rejoicing that takes place in the heavens in verse 10. Look at this. Likewise, I, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, there's a lot of people who misquote this verse, and it's easy to do if you don't pay careful attention. Uh, they say that what that teaches us is that the angels of heaven rejoice when someone gets saved. But that's not what it says. That's not what it says. It says the angels in heaven are rejoiced in front of, or the people, the, the constituency of heaven rejoice when someone is saved in the presence of the angels. You say angels have never been saved. They don't know what it's like to be lost and then saved. They've not been saved. Well, listen to this. There are those in heaven who do know what it means to be saved. They do understand what it means to be saved. How many of you were saved as an adult? Would you raise your hand? All right, many of you, many of you saved as an adult. You know what your life was like before you got saved. You know, I, I was saved very young. I was saved when I was nine years old. How many of you were saved when you were under 12 years old? Would you raise your hand? All right, a bunch of you. But you know, you live long enough and, and you think, man, I really recognize and realize just what God saved me from. I'm thankful that God saved me from me. Amen. Because, you know, you get, you get on a pathway of destruction and, and lostness. And, and there you reside and there you live. And you, you get uh, where you're an adult and you look back and you think, man, God, God has blessed me so much. I can't even believe how much he has best blessed me. Now listen again. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels. Imagine this. Here's a mother who prayed for 25 years for her son to get saved. Her son was ungodly, immoral, hung out the bars, did a lot of things he didn't want to do, and she passes away. And then uh, 25 years later, some strange morning, or for some strange reason, on a Sunday morning, he got up and felt compelled to go to church. And so he goes to church, and uh, after the sermon was over, he walks down the aisle and he accepts Jesus as his Lord and personal Savior. Now, here's what, here's what I want you to imagine. He gets saved. Mother have been praying for him for 25 years. And the Lord gets on the heavenly intercom. And he goes, attention, attention. John Smith just got saved. And his mother starts kicking up gold dust on that street of gold. <laughs> and she's running through the street of gold yelling and rejoicing. My son has gotten saved. The circle will be unbroken. I will see him again one day. You see, that's what moms do. They pray for us and they're diligent and they don't give up. George W. Truett, pastor of First Baptist Church, uh, Church Dallas for 50 years, for a long time. He was walking down Main Street one day and a man 
came down the aisle or came down the street and asked him, he said, would you pray for my lost son? I pray for him every day. He seems to have no interest in becoming a Christian. This man's wife had died years earlier. She'd passed away, had already gone to heaven. My son's not a Christian. I don't know what to do. Can we pray for him? And Dr. Truett said, of course we can. And right there in the middle of that street, they began to pray for that young man. The next day, that young man approached Dr. Truett and looked at him and said, Dr. Truett, last night, my dad came down the aisle or found you out on the street after the service and, and asked you to pray for me. And I'd been out with my buddies and we'd been drinking and carousing around and, and uh, I came home late in the, the night and normally when my, I would come home, my dad would jump all over me and chew me out for being late, but this time he didn't. In fact, I walked by his room and I heard him inside the room calling out to God and asking God to save me. And I thought I'd just tell you that last night I gave my heart to Jesus and Dr. Truett said, oh, that's so wonderful, son. That's so wonderful. And then the young man bowed his head. He said, I only wish my mother knew. I wish she could have seen it. I wish she knew. And Dr. Truett put his arm around that young man. He said, oh, son, she knows. If you've been to one of the funerals I've conducted, you know I, I quote Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 1 in every single message. That when God calls one of his loved ones home, a saved person home, they join a great cloud of witnesses and they cheer for us as we continue to run the race for the Lord Jesus. How many of you have moms in heaven? Would you raise your hand? You know what she's doing for you right now? You know what she's doing for you? She's cheering for you as you continue to run the race for the Lord. 